Thank you for worshiping with us here today at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. I'm Pastor Sue Collar. If you'd like to download the bulletin or the announcement sheet for today's service, you can do that at our website, fpclincoln.org. Just click on Watch and Listen and then the online services. And you can also download the children's bulletins from that same location. If you happen to be watching on Facebook with us, say hi in the comments. We'd love to know who's worshiping together with us. And if there's anything we could do to reach out to you, to connect with you, to get to know you better, or see if you have any questions, email us at info at fpclincoln.org, and I'll be sure to get back to you on that and connect. We've got a couple things coming up I want you to put on your calendar. Next Sunday, February 27th, is our annual meeting of the Congregation, Corporation, and Foundation. And we are going to be live streaming that to Facebook. We're also going to live stream the 10 a.m. worship service to Facebook. That means we are not recording worship in advance for next week. So if you're one of those who's had the habit of Saturday night going to our website and worshiping then, we won't be having the worship service up. So you'll need to come to Facebook at 10 a.m. to join us all for worship at that time. If you aren't able to make that, we will save a recording of that service and post it to our uh, website later on Sunday. So we will be live streaming at 10 a.m. to Facebook our worship service, and immediately following that, we're going to go right into our annual meeting, and we will be live streaming that as well. For privacy reasons, we're not going to live stream the business portion of that meeting, but you will still get to hear all of the celebrations that we're going to be having and some of our dreams and plans for the year coming up. So I hope you'll join us for that. Tonight, if you happen to be watching on Sunday the 20th, is trivia night. We haven't had that for a little while. A lot of fun. You could go to our website, click the events tab, and find out how to connect on Zoom for trivia night. And some of you may have been looking forward to the dinner in a book discussion group that meets at the eatery restaurant. It was going to start this coming Wednesday, but for a variety of reasons, we're going to be pushing that back a couple weeks, and we're going to be starting on Wednesday, March 9th. So Wednesday, March 9th at the eatery restaurant for dinner in a book. Click on the events tab. You can find out all about it. Also coming up in March is a new online study on prayer. So if you are one of those people who's wanted to deepen your prayer life or have a greater understanding of the different ways people pray, this is for you. Uh, again, events tab on the website, you should be getting the hang of that. You can find the Learning to Pray class there and read all about it and register for it. I hope you'll join us for it. I think it's going to be a wonderful opportunity to deepen our prayer life and our spirituality. So I think that's enough for me for now. Before we dive into worship, let us take a moment to center our hearts and minds on God.
So today we're going to talk about the challenge of living a life of faith in a world that doesn't value that faith. We're going to be talking about why it seems like those who do the wrong thing keep getting ahead and those who do the right thing keep getting knocked down. Some people might look at us and say, what's the point of faith? What's in it for us? Well, that's the kind of thing we're going to be talking about today in our worship service. Let's begin, though, with a word of prayer. So often, Lord, we do see people get ahead who blatantly steal and cheat and lie, and we wonder, where are you? What's going on? We get depressed because we just don't buy into their values Yet living by values of generosity and service and forgiveness isn't always easy, and it doesn't always seem to benefit us. So as we wrestle with these questions today, speak to us. Even as we offer you our worship, please offer us your wisdom, that we may have greater understanding of what you are doing in the world and our place in it. So open our ears to hear, our minds to understand, and our hearts to embrace. Amen. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that God has made. Open up. Of justice, let us be glad as we pass through those gates. This is the place where the righteous may enter, singing to God with thanksgiving and praise. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that God has made. Psalm 37 is a psalm about trust and choice. What kind of a world do you want to live in? In the verses we'll be skipping over, the psalmist continues the pattern we will hear in the first 11 verses, going back and forth, contrasting the life of the wicked with the life of those who trust their lives to God, ending with a statement of faith in God's saving power. Listen for the word of God today from Psalm 37. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way or over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only leads to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but for those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land." Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and serves them because they take refuge in him. It's the age-old question. Why do bad things happen to good people? And why do bad people seem to get all the breaks? Or why do the wicked seem to prosper while those who do what is right don't? Why do those who manipulate others to get what they want get away with it? You could say that doing the right thing is its own reward, but is it really? How about if you're a good person 
but you still need to work three or four jobs just to put food on the table. Is that fair? Or if you stand up for what's right and you get harassed or bullied because of it, is it worth it? Or what if the message you get is from your own church that if you do good, you will reap financial rewards and then you don't? You might have heard the term prosperity gospel. It links Christian faith with physical, material, and financial success. A 2006 poll found that 17% of American Christians identify with this idea of the prosperity gospel. 31% espouse the idea that if you give your money to God, God will bless you with more money. Well, what happens if you work hard but you don't see success? What if you go above and beyond in your giving and all you have to show for it is a smaller bank account? We don't often ask the question this bluntly, but, you know, this Christian faith stuff, what's really in it for us? Is it all about what comes later and we just have to endure an unjust world until God's kingdom finally comes in its fullness sometime down the road? Is it enough to say that, well, I know God is with me even though I'm struggling? Is that enough? Both of those are actually very powerful things. Knowing that we are not alone, that God is with us, and knowing that God has a plan for this world, a plan for healing and wholeness and peace. I personally hang on to both of those things. They, they help me through the day. But I suspect we've probably all asked, at one point or another, isn't it supposed to be a little easier than this, a little better than this? Psalm 37 says, Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Well, how long do we have to wait for them to fade and wither? Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and God will give you the desires of your heart. I desire to win the lottery. Hasn't happened yet. I long to live in a world where everyone lives peaceably with each other. Hasn't happened yet. Psalm 37 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for the Lord. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way. Easier said than done. I think what we're really struggling with is how do we live in a world that isn't fair and that isn't just and that doesn't always reward good behavior? Our best efforts to do the right thing it just don't always pay off. How do we live in this world? How do we sustain ourselves in this imperfect world? Well, the psalmist says that what sustains us is ultimately the knowledge that God rules the world. God laughs at the wicked because one day all they've accomplished will just disintegrate into dust. One day, the righteous will inherit the earth. Meanwhile, the psalmist says, don't fret. Just refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Be generous and keep giving. Be patient and keep giving. You know, one day God's reign will be visible everywhere, so live now as if that day were already here. That's what Psalm 37 is telling us. You know the day's coming. Live now as if it were already here. Now, if that sounds like something Jesus would say, it is. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus dares to go against the prevailing wisdom of his day, telling those who want to be part of his community to love your enemies, do good to those who hurt you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you, 
Give to everyone who begs from you. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Jesus used to say that wherever those values were practiced and whenever the sick were healed, whenever those who were hungry were fed, whenever those who were lonely were cared for, the reign of God is here. Not this is what you can expect when the kingdom of God comes in its fullness. No, he was saying the reign of God is, is here right now in this place. It exists wherever we choose to live by those values that reflect the character of a gracious and loving God. Now the psalmist takes a slightly different road, but he gets to the same place saying that we need to anticipate the future. And if we anticipate that future, it's going to have a profound effect on how we choose to live in the present. Now, neither Jesus nor the psalmist were saying that if we do what is good and right and generous and gracious, that everyone, will, uh, everyone around us will respond in like ways. We already know that's not going to happen. And we know that no matter how much we love our enemy, enemies, no matter how much we pray for those who hurt us, no matter how generous we are, we still live in the midst of a world where injustice rather than justice holds sway. We still live in a world where the wicked prosper and those who try to do the right thing struggle. But still, both Jesus and the psalmist urge us to this other way of life. Because what ends up being different isn't really the world around us, it's us. By choosing to live by grace, the grace we hope will flood the earth, we ground ourselves in the one God who will outlast everything. By choosing to be generous when others are not. Generous in giving, generous in mercy, generous in forgiveness, generous in helping, we connect ourselves to the power of God in this world. And it feeds us. It empowers us. When we find ourselves doing those things that Jesus did, when we find ourselves living in such a way that reflects God's character in the world, yeah, it's not always easy, but it empowers us. It reinforces that promise that what is good will last. What is loving will last. Because we will already have experienced the power of those things. And we have. I mean, we have all seen love conquer hate. We've seen generosity defeat greed. We've seen all the powers of injustice aligned against what is good and right. And we have seen injustice crumble. Maybe not as often as we would like, but we have seen it happen. We have examples of these things in our own lives and in our world. And even as imperfect as those occasions have been, we know their power. We have tasted it. So when we choose to live by that kind of grace and love and generosity, it changes us. It reinforces our desire to do even more of that because we see the difference it could make in this world. It also builds a community. A community of others who are living the same way, who also recognize that the character of God's grace and love is what is going to change this world. And so we gather ourselves a community that can sustain us in an imperfect world. And that can also empower us to create the world we want right now. By the way, this is the message of all of the Old Testament prophets. You don't have to wait to experience God's reign. You start simply by embracing it and living it, wherever you are, in whatever circumstances you find yourself. When you start to do that, it changes you. And it starts to begin the, to change the world around you. 
in our Living the Questions class that meets on Monday nights, biblical scholar John Dominic Crossan said that uh, people would have heard the preaching of these first century apostles, the ones who were around Jesus and Paul who came afterwards, and they would have said, you know, this is all fine and good. You know, you're talking about this guy who says love everybody. You're talking about this guy who, who rose from the dead. That's all fine and good, but what's in it for me? What's in it for me? And Paul's answer was, well, come and see. Come and see this community that's living in new ways. Come and see how generosity weaves through everything we do. Come and see how there are no outsiders. There's a place for everyone at God's table. Come and see what God is doing among us. Come and experience the reign of God in our midst. We become proof, Crossan says, that God rules the world when we choose to live as if God rules the world. J. Clinton McCann, he's a professor of biblical interpretation at Eden Seminary in St. Louis, says that the only proof we can offer that God rules the world is the tangible existence of a community that is shaped by the character of God and God's claim. We prove that God rules the world when we trust in God, do good, commit our way to God, give generously, seek justice, open ourselves to God's instruction, and take refuge in God. Such humble dependence on God is, he says, in effect to inherit the land. It is life as God intends it, abundant and eternal. What a concept. We become the proof that God's reign is real. We, by how we live, become the proof that love is more powerful than hate, generosity more powerful than greed, and justice more powerful than injustice. Kind of makes you think twice about how you live your life, doesn't it? And what your life says to other people. I still say, though, one of the biggest challenges of faith is how do we sustain ourselves in a world that's not what we hope for and pray for? Maybe when we are at our best, we become that proof that God rules the world. People see that in us and they see the change that happens. But it's hard to stay positive and it's hard to keep doing the right thing. There are so many reasons to be disillusioned and disappointed. Because, you know, I may do the right thing, but that doesn't mean everybody else will. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be smacked down for it. You know, there are so many reasons I think we could all think of to just give up and say, you know, this world is not going to get any better than it is, so why try? I've certainly had my times when I felt like it didn't matter what I did, the wicked always won. There were a couple times where I actually sunk into a pretty deep depression because of it. But what pulled me out every time was the community of faith who reminded me and showed me that the power of love and generosity are more powerful than any of the powers of the world arrayed against us. They reconnected me to the source of life. It is not easy to live in opposition to the values of this world. And it's not easy to suffer at the hands of those who don't care who they walk over to get what they want. But when we have a community of people around us who are all trying to live by a different set of values, who are all trying to follow in those footsteps of Jesus, and perfectly as we do sometimes, but when we are surrounded by a community of people who says, we may not be perfect, but we know this is the path to life, they can lift us up and they can encourage us. They could even lend us their faith when our faith falters. And it's like we're reborn. When we become part of a community of faith, 
living out the generosity of God among ourselves and showing that same generosity to those who some might say don't deserve it, we discover that God really is powerful. and God really is at work right now in this world, in this place, and in our lives. So in the words of the psalmist, don't fret because of the wicked. Don't be envious of wrongdoers. They will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Rather, trust in the Lord and do good. For the meek shall inherit the land and delight in abundant prosperity. We don't have to wait. We can start enjoying that life and prosperity right now. It just doesn't look like the prosperity of money in the bank. It's the prosperity of knowing that we belong to something so much bigger than ourselves. It's a prosperity of knowing that we have a God who is with us even now, who walks with us and who guides our path. It's the prosperity of knowing that God's love is more powerful than anything else out in this world. So don't fret. Trust in the Lord and do good. Remember that the land that we inherited, because the psalmist talks about the meek shall inherit the land. Jesus says the meek shall inherit the earth. We've all heard that before. Remember, that's not a geographical place. I mean, maybe one day it will be. I, I hope it will be one day. But it's also right here and right now in the community that embraces generosity and graciousness in all things towards all people. May this community be that for you when you need it. And together, may we be that community for the world which we know needs it. Amen.
Hello, friends. It's a joy to be worshiping with you again. Earlier today, you heard a scripture passage, and, and it had some challenging words for us, especially, I think, for you as kids. It talks about people who have done not so good things, but yet they got away with it, or they didn't get caught. Have you ever seen that happen? When a person does something wrong or mean and nothing happens to them? They don't get in trouble? Maybe they even benefit from it. Doesn't seem fair, does it? So what are we to do? Well, God reminds us that we can't always change everything or everybody. But what we can do is to continue to follow God and make good choices for ourselves. We can try to always do the right thing, even when others aren't. It's not always easy. But we know that God is with us. Our passage reminds us of this, too, that God is always with us and that we can trust God to help us when maybe we get angry about what other people do. We can trust God to help us figure out what the right choice is for ourselves. And how do we do that? Well, we can pray about it, of course, but we can also talk to others that we trust, maybe like your parents, other family members, your Sunday school teachers, or even your pastors. We all have lots of people in our lives who love us and want the best for us. And that is a gift from God. So when you see something wrong happening, and you, or you have a tough choice to make about that, know that you can turn to God and to those who love you to help you. Let's pray together. And remember, I'm going to say a few words, and I invite you to say those words after me, but say them in your heart. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for always being with us, for helping us to make good choices, and for placing people in our lives to help us. Amen. Thanks everybody for joining me, and we'll see you again soon. Bye now. Let us join together in prayer. We draw near to you, O God, in the silence of this place, to share the prayers that are on our hearts this day. We draw near to you, O God, in thanksgiving, with gratitude for the blessings that overflow in our lives, for food and shelter for our families and for friendships that sustain us, for opportunities to learn about you and who you're calling us to be. We draw near to you in joy, Thankful for times of celebration and delight. For the children in our lives and in this church who bring meaning to us and remind us of what's important. And the visual reminders of the world of the wonder of your creation. Hear our silent individual prayers of thanksgiving, O Lord. We draw near to you for guidance, O God. Help us to hear your word for us in each situation so that we might discern your will and live lives worthy of your calling. May your word be at work in us, changing us and nudging us toward faithfulness. We draw near to you, O God, not merely for ourselves, but for others who struggle this day. We pray for those who are sick and in need of healing. We pray for those recuperating and working to grow stronger in health. We pray for those who tend to them and help them along the way. Touch them, O oh God, with your healing touch. Remind us, O oh God, that we are not alone. We pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones, that you would bring comfort and hope. We pray for your presence and comfort to wrap around them and hold them close. Hear our individual silent prayers, O Lord. We draw near to you, O God, on behalf of your world. We pray for peace. We yearn for justice. We ask for wisdom and guidance for our leaders. 
We draw near to you, O God, and ask you to draw near to us, individually and as a church, in ways that we can sense and in ways that make a difference. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray using these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As we come to this time of gratitude, we give thanks to all of those that came before us with their generosity that allows us to worship together today. Through your past gifts, through their past gifts, through your future gifts, we are able to share God's word. Your gifts have allowed us to keep the organ and the piano tuned, which would really be hurting our worship services if we didn't have that ability. Your giving supported the back to school jam this past fall, which brought our neighborhood families together and allowed us to send home bags full of school supplies to children in our neighborhood. Your continued support will let us continue to dream to make all of these dreams possible. You may give online, you can give by text, you can mail in your gift to the church office. Let us pray. Lord, our creator, we give you thanks for all of our blessings. Allow us to share these blessings with others today and in the years to come. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As we go out into the world this day, we go out as a community of faith. We may feel sometimes like we just go out as one person, but we know we have the whole community gathered around us through the Spirit of Christ. So I know it's hard sometimes, but go out there and live by those kingdom values of generosity and love and mercy and forgiveness. Let that be what you are known for. Don't worry about anybody else. As the psalmist said, don't fret. Just live your own faith and encourage each other. In doing so, you will have brought the kingdom of God just a little bit closer. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.
Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org or find us on Facebook.